Lindy Madsen Mott grew up in many different areas of the country as her father was employed in the Air Force. She later went on to receive a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from Brigham Young University in Design and Illustration in 1997. Painting is not her only talent, though. She's become known as the Quilt Lady since many of her works include fine, fine quilts. She has a passion for church history, historical clothing, in which she sews herself, and creating visually accurate images of the past. Lindy has said, the variety of women's roles, both historically and presently, has always impressed me. Most inspiring is the aspect of nurturing and pure loving compassion that women and mothers seem uniquely blessed with. I strive for a balance between intricate detail and large, powerful shapes, between strength and sensitivity, and between an individual's private inner emotions and the, and the experiences that connect us all as members of the human family. Lindy is married to Randy Ma, and they have three teenage boys, nine chickens, and a canary. <laughs> they built their beautiful home in Pleasant Grove, which Lindy has filled with her inspiring artwork. Everything in their home, top to bottom, inside and out, including the chicken coop, has Lindy's <laughs> unique girl face on them. Her husband has cheerfully resigned himself to the fact that no surface is safe from Lindy. Thank you for the marvelous. Oh, I see you're starting to speak directly into the microphone. Okay. Uh, <laughs> for the marvelous introduction. And my goodness, what a, a splendid opportunity to, to be here and to be with all of you this morning. Uh, I think you may be aware that it is morning. <laughs> it is a Saturday morning in the bleak midwinter of February, and y'all look fabulous. <laughs> you look great. You look like you brushed your teeth and <laughs> got cool colors on it. You look great. I'm very impressed. And I know, I know how you felt. I, I can feel it for me. That musical number, when the gal, the first gal, started singing, and her voice lifted out over the, the rafters of the chapel, it, it just hurt me, and I, I started to cry, and you know how it is, when you're about to, to speak, and you feel yourself starting to cry, <laughs> oh, mascara, mascara, okay, okay, okay cool, <laughs> but it was so beautiful, um, now, I know how you felt, in order that you wanted to applaud, didn't you, I, I felt it right, in order to preserve the records of the chapel, we don't applaud, but I thought I'd introduce to you another alternative, for you know that when uh, deaf uh, people uh, meet, they, they don't applaud like this. It, the sound doesn't mean anything to, to them. They applaud like this. So I thought I'd have uh, the cute, uh, beautiful gals who sang. Would you mind standing for a moment? Let's see. Let's see you around. Okay, turn around. And everyone ready? <laughs> I hope you feel the love. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with us and calling my nerves a bit. Come with me, my friends, for it is not too late to seek a newer world, for my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the western stars until I die. It may be that the ghost will wash us down. It may be that we will touch upon, upon the friendly isles. Though much is taken, much abides, and though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong and will, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. I love this quote by Tennyson, Ulysses, because I love the idea, of, the idea of sailing beyond the sunset to the dim land of the unfamiliar, to push the, push the envelope. The gospel gives us the opportunity to search and wander our entire lives and never reach the end, never reach the edge of the uh, interest, of the compassion, of the love that the gospel of Jesus Christ affords us. So to continue the nautical metaphor, one does not discover new lands without consenting to lose sight of the shore for a very long time. And ships and harbor are safe, but that is not what ships are for. What would we have done if Columbus kept hugging the coast like his uh, uh, contemporaries did, instead of being willing to sell out beyond the sunset into new lands. I recall a line from one of my favorite Jane Austen novels, How Much Do We Love Jane Austen, where <laughs> the men, uh, <laughs> the men uh, uh, come in uh, and uh, gather around, around the fire, you know, men and women play their cards and so forth, and one of them laments, we live in these beautiful immense rooms and we spend our lives three feet from the fire. Three feet 
feet from where it's comfortable, three feet from where it's warm. The emotional and intellectual bravery to go out into new land and discover new things. So that's a bit what I'd like to try to do today. I have been assigned to speak to Rise to the Divine Within. Doesn't that sound great and noble and worthy? My first response, my first feeling when I heard that great, uh, great subject was, okay, how? <laughs> Do you feel like Enos sometimes? Lord, how is it done? <laughs> that was his first response after he was hunting all day and prayed and felt distill upon him forgiveness and then he prayed for his friends and he felt, and then he prayed for his enemies and he felt that. And then he said, Lord, how is it done? Or maybe like the uh, blind men in, in Jerusalem who called out in complete and utter darkness, only having faith that the Lord was passing by, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on us. And I can relate to that. Sometimes I feel like I'm crying out in my darkness, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Show me how this is done. The work of the Lord will not be made manifest by cowards after all. To do divine work, we're going to need to acquire an element of the divine. Dr. Shibato, the beast that lies asleep in mankind, will not be held down by threats. He will only be awakened by the irresistible power of unarmed truth. Let's try some unarmed truth and see how irresistible it is. So my title, title of my talk is Rubber Hits the Road, Rise to the Divine. From every, from every different speaker, you'll get something different. From me, you get this. Even more important than the five senses to a happy, joyful, meaningful life are the three senses. You don't need all five to lead a happy, meaningful, joyful life. Just ask Helen Keller, or Stevie Wonder, or David Hawkins. But you do need to de develop these, a sense of humor. Oh, do you know what I just saw? This is such a great perspective from a speaker. I just saw it go. <laughs> that was charming. Okay, you ready? Do I think you have enough time? A sense of beauty <laughs> and a sense of reverence. Number one, let's start at the top sense of humor. I have a lovely assistant. <laughs> If he's going to unveil in some dramatic way uh, my sense of a <laughs> sense of humor painting. This is such a beautiful reversal of the Pat and Dana thing, <laughs> isn't it? They look like <laughs> such panache. <laughs> Thank you, baby. <laughs> as, as opposed to reverence, humor gives us balance and perspective. Uh, this cute little uh, yellow flower girl. I imagine she was, you know, had her head down. She was uh, picking, you know, the, the little uh, the little petals, the little crumbs and things that she was enjoying, looking at the little buds and so forth. And then maybe the sun came out. And she looked up and she went, oh. <laughs> and sometimes there's a sense of humor, a good, uplifting, appropriate sense of humor, just bring things into perspective. The sun comes out when we uh, uh, bring things into perspective that way. I truly believe that when we get to the other side, we will experience a great deal of generosity. We'll probably complain of our mistakes. We'll look at the long, uh, you know, uh, uh, blank portions of our life review where we've repented. <laughs> and we'll feel a, a, a little bit of a, a sorrow and, and we'll experience some self-judgment. I don't I don't know if we'll be judged by others as much as we'll experience that self-judgment. That's just my intuition. At which point, the uh, angels will probably give us a raspberry. And they'll probably say something like, well, your first problem was you had a body. That tabernacle of clay, it's dicey. What, you think you're going to escape the mortal muddled mill? <laughs> We're not going to escape that. So uh, here's my thought. Don't take yourself so seriously. There's things in life to take seriously, and there's most other things to not take seriously. And don't take your thoughts so darn seriously. Just because you have a thought doesn't mean it's valid. <laughs> Just because you have a thought doesn't mean it's true. And it doesn't mean that it should be taken seriously. When you start to hear that negative self-talk, that, that voice, 
you know, baby voice, and you know the voice that I'm talking about. The one that says, you're too, you're too chubby, you're too uh, lazy, you're too, uh, to, to get up and go to church with all those righteous people, you might as well stay in bed. Probably the most uh, valid or uh, appropriate response to that thought is, whoa, voice, you better chill out. You better take 10 margaritas, go on a cruise and get a massage, and then maybe I'll listen to you. <laughs> Don't take yourself so seriously. When you kind of fall into that habit, it's easy to just fall right out. Let me give you some uh, techniques. I always try temporary insanity. <laughs> when I come back and I say, never mind, kids, let's go ahead and open a gift on Christmas Eve. It's one day you do my temporary insanity. <laughs> or I try this one. Oh, there's a really simple explanation for that. I was wrong. Or you might try it. <laughs> My favorite line from the best movie ever made, talking to a priest at the end of the show who's heard all of his troubles, he just laughs and says, Don't worry, Father. I'll speak for you. I speak for all the world's mediocrities. I am their champion. I am their patron saint. And that helps me. Sometimes it's okay, it's human, to just acknowledge you can be the patient saint of being not right now and then. <laughs> so you had to repent, so what? It's good for you. I appreciate it. I appreciate those words, verbatim, mind you, from our regional representative, uh, Area 70, who's talking to us at a big conference, and he said those words. So you had to repent, so what? It's good for you. So your kid had to repent, so what? It's good for them. <laughs> You're not going to escape the mortal muddle middle. <laughs> Sense of humor. So, rubber hits the road. Oh, forgive me. I want to share a few more things with you. Spirit-filled people are often filled with mirth, aren't they? Mirth and lightness. The Savior himself was. I have a theory. I sense that one of the reasons that the Savior was so um, followed and adored was because he was charismatic. I think that there... Don't get me wrong, I, I sense that it, he was able to sense the right venue, and he was able to do the right thing in the right venue, to feel the temperature of the room and feel what had to be done in the right time and place. But I also think that uh, he probably had the, dis the disciples laughing so hard, seeing the irony of life and acknowledging the paradox of things that they were trying to do, laughing so hard that they begged him to stop. <laughs> I, I think that maybe when that there's a, a Christian saying, you know, what would Jesus do? But perhaps when we consider what would Jesus do, we should keep in mind that brandishing the whip and cleansing the temple twice is in the realm of possibility. We should also maybe consider that calling out hypocritical behavior with a crazy clever insult is in the realm of possibility. <laughs> Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto white sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outwards, but inwards are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. <laughs> when I went to Jerusalem, I stood on the Mount of Olives and looked over towards the old city and saw all these whited sepulchres down below, and this particular saying became particularly true to me. Also consider his use of hyperbole to make a point. It is easier for a camel to, to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. How they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Or also, if anyone causes one of these little ones to stumble, it would be better for him that a millstone were run, hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Have you seen an ancient millstone? It's two, one, two, to three tons. And it can only be moved by cattle or, or a couple dozen men, you know, to grind those, those hollows. What an overstatement this was from a compassionate, uniquely intellectual soul like the Savior. He was using hyperbole to make a point. Or maybe the occasion cause calls for a quick rerouting of priorities. Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and render unto God that which is God's. Or, and I always imagine he said this with a bit of a sigh, 
He is without, who is without sin among you. Why don't you cast the first stone at her? He appreciated the sometimes strange paradoxes of life. Also, why else would he tell us to be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves? So we have precedents for using a sense of humor. We have options, we have lots of options. <laughs> and oftentimes, a sense of humor is the most uplifting one. Can I give you just a couple quick examples? In my house, we uh, had a morning devotional with my young boys when we uh, edu educated at home for a few years. And with the family, you know, of, of when we were together, just four of us, and, you know, we're praying in the morning when, over our food, and you know, so there's a lot, a lot of prayers in the day, so there's a lot of chances to pray. So I started getting these, uh, this uh, whiplash effect, this, you know, uh, I, I prayed yesterday, or, you know, I prayed this morning, and, you know, this refusal uh, for my boys to pray, despite my efforts to tell them what a blessing prayer was. So finally I said, all right, when I ask you to pray, you may think whatever you want. The law of agency overrides all others. You fought a war to preserve your agency, I get it. So you can think whatever you want, but in this house, what out comes out of your mouth is, quote, you bet, and may I add, thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> and it worked! I saw, you know, kind of with what we call the Jack Leonard face, you know, when I asked them to pray, sometimes Jack Leonard face, you bet, and may I add, thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> A few weeks later, I was walking out of in church, and a wonderful lady in my ward who happens to teach, and Jonathan, my oldest, uh, came up to me. I was almost in tears. She was emotional. She said, do you know what Jonathan said when I asked him to pray today? <laughs> Contentment and joy are only available to those who 
To which he replied, well, there goes plan A. <laughs> I thought, what a great, what a great way to zap me back into perspective. Reverence. And isn't it interesting how so much of life is about the tension that flows between opposites? You know, a sense of humor, a sense of reverence, which balances out, that balances out of both. Uh, let's see, which one is that? I mean, is that this one? <laughs> What do you hold sacred? What do you revere, protect, and admire? This uh, little uh, little flower child, it sounds so hippie. I, I call this series just for short, the Flower Children series, and it sounds so, you know, <laughs> so uh, 1960s. Um, I, I like how she's uh, just kind of holding uh, special, her, her special flowers, her, her find there. Uh, you probably can't see with the distance, but there's a, 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 a lurid little grasshopper in the corner that she's kind of noticing. It's like, ooh, come on, I want to keep these safe from, from him. What do you reference and what do you hold sacred? Earth is crammed with heaven. It's only those who see it that take off their shoes. And of course, that's an allusion to Moses before the burning bush when when the Lord told him, remove the shoes from your feet, for the place you stand is holy ground. This entire earth and this entire opportunity is holy ground. We got on our knees and begged for the opportunity to come here, to this planet, to this earth, and we begged for the opportunity to come here at this time and place because of the opportunities that it would give us to refine our souls. I remember when um, in the scripture, uh, when Moses comes before the burning bush, which I really have a feeling was uh, just a way to say a, a cloud of light, because of course the only kind of light in the darkness that they had was, was fire, you know, being unfamiliar with electricity or other forms of, of light. So, the burning bush, you know, a way to say a, a cloud of fire. And Moses, we can, we can relate to it. He, uh, upon hearing his assignment, uh, said, Oh, Lord, I am not eloquent, neither given to foreign nor since thou first spoke to thy servant, for I have a slow speech and a slow tongue. And the Lord responded, Who created man's mouth? Who created the seeing, the hearing, the deaf, or the blind? Did not I? Now go! And I will be with you when you talk to Pharaoh. I will be with you, Moses. So in essence, he was saying, don't tell me what you can't do. I created you. I would know. Now go, and I will be with you. Albert Einstein, there are two ways to live your life. One is if everything is a miracle. The other is if nothing is a miracle. And Joseph Smith taught us, Thy mind, O man, and thou wilt lead one soul to salvation, must stretch as high as the utmost heavens, and search into and contemplate the deepest of this and the broad expanse of eternity. Thou must commune with God. But there are many ways to reverence life, not just in a devotional context, not just in a, we, we need to categorize our sense of reverence, our sense of devotion to church and Sunday. We don't need to categorize it in that way. There are many ways to fill this. We can feel reverence for our home, our land, our people. Listen to uh, this poem by Willow Cather. Evening and the flat land, rich and somber and always silent. The miles of freshly plowed soil, heavy and black, full of strength and harshness. The growing wheat, the crowing weeds, the toiling horses, the tired men, the long, empty roads, sullen fires of sunset fading, the eternal, unrelenting sky. Against all this youth, flaming like the wild roses, flashing like a star out of the twilight, singing like a lark over the plowed fields, youth with its insupportable sweetness, its fierce desire, its sharp necessity, singing and singing, out of the lips of silence, out of the earthy dust. Isn't that a beautiful sense of reverence? For her land and her people. Now, uh, we, we can have 
have reverence for our country. We can have reverence for an idea, a single powerful illuminating idea. We can have a reverence for the human body. I know that I do. For the beautiful as a daily, on a daily basis as I'm learning about the, the body uh, and the intricacies thereof, uh, I, I feel to kneel before it. And that's just the physical body. How about the mind body? Uh, the 99.9% of us that's other than conscious. Uh, Bruce R. McConkie said, the book of life is the record of the acts of man as such record is written on their own body. That is the very joint sinews and flesh of the mortal body carries its marks. And every thought or indeed has an effect on the human body. All these leave their marks, marks which can be read by him who is a journalist easily as a book, book can be read. So how do we improve our sense of reverence? How does the rubber hit the road? The answer is found in this beautiful quote by John Ruskin. I believe that the mark of a truly great man, man is his humility. I don't mean by humility down his power, but truly great men have a curious feeling that greatness is not of them, but through them. And they see something divine in every other man, and they are endlessly, incredibly, foolishly, merciful. So there it was. See something divine in every other man. Look for it, because when you look for it, you will find it. There's an ancient Buddha saying, the divine in me sees the divine in you, recognizes the divine in you. My time is whizzling away quickly, and I need to get to a sense of beauty. <laughs> George O'Keefe, the painter of poppies, uh, said that when you look closely and when you swim in that, that vision and when you uh, fully uh, stay in that moment, that is your world. That is your world for that moment. And developing a sense of beauty, I think, was very important to our, to our creator. Why else would he have given us such tremendous variety and opportunity? Uh, in this world, to enjoy a sense of, of the divine through a sense of beauty. Our mind is a miracle, isn't it? John Adams said, I must study politics and war that my children may have liberty to study mathematics and philosophy. My children ought to study mathematics and philosophy, naval architecture, commerce, agriculture, navigation, in, to give their children a right to study painting and poetry and music and tapestry and porcelain. You notice he said, the right. That is our birthright. Our birthright is to walk hand in hand with God as creators. One more quote. I counted up the quotes in this, there were 30. Sorry. G.K. <laughs> Chesterton. Contemporary to C.S. Lewis, Anish Love, Chesterton Lewis, the whole object of real art, real romance, and real, and above all, real religion, is to prevent people from losing the humility and gratitude that is thankful for daylight and daily bread. To prevent them from regarding daily life as too dull or domestic life as too narrow. To teach them to see in the sunlight the song of Apollo. Actually, he said, to teach them to feel in the sunlight the song of Apollo and the bread, the epic of the plow. What is needed most is intensive imagination. I need the imagination to turn our, the power, I mean the power to turn our imagination inwards to the things we already have and to make those things live. And I have celebrated humanity by participating in the creative arts. I believe deeply that no one is born without their work being born with them. And I believe God when he said, men are that they might have joy, and not men are that they might get a lot of them, or men are that they might suffer and endure and then return to me. He said, men are that they might have joy. I have a six and a half minute video to show you now. <laughs> I did, I'm excited, because we just took it last Saturday. <laughs> and uh, we'll, uh, we'll tell you what, I'll show it to you first, enjoy that, and then, uh, then I'll tell you a little bit more about it in the time I have left. 
Um, allow me to mention that my favorite music in all the world uh, accompanies it. It's by Felix Mendelssohn. It's his concerto in E minor, third movement, Allegro Molto de Vache. <laughs> Hope you enjoy it. All right. <laughs>
to rise to divine within by choosing the most uplifting response, sense of humor, mindfully seeing the divine in all in all aspects of life and humanity, sense of reverence, and gleefully participating in the opportunity of creation, sense of beauty. In the name of him who died, that we may live abundantly, even Jesus Christ. Amen.